Okay, hi everyone. So this lecture is on microbial pathogenesis. Um, what we essentially mean by microbial pathogenesis is the ability of microorganisms to cause disease. So microbial, relating to microorganisms, pathogenesis, the origin of disease. So as we know, because you will have covered this in your first year microbiology modules, uh, microorganisms are capable of causing disease in humans. So again, not all microorganisms, but many microorganisms are capable of infecting a human host. And when they infect a human host, they are capable of causing disease. Now, it's of interest to us to understand the exact process by which these microorganisms cause human disease. Now, there's a couple of reasons why this is really important. Firstly, if we're thinking about diagnosis, which one of the, is one of the things we're thinking about now in the context of this case study, we can use symptoms of disease as indicators of the type of disease we're looking at. So when we're talking about diagnosis of infectious disease, we're really talking about determining what the causative agent of disease is. Okay. Um, now, if we know the symptoms associated with a particular type of disease, so with a particular infectious agent, um, we can therefore link the two. And this is really, really useful. So it, it, it's mostly of interest to physicians because they're the ones who are conducting these diagnoses. When we're talking about laboratory science, we're more interested in lab techniques. However, it's still interesting for us to understand this perspective and understand how specific symptoms can be used to indicate the type of infectious disease that is present. Another clear reason why it's of interest to us to understand the specific mechanisms of microbial pathogenesis is because we, as research scientists, have an interest in developing interventions that prevent microbial disease. So we want to prevent microorganisms from causing disease in humans. And if we want to do this, we can very often specifically target the microbial pathogenesis. So we can prevent the microorganism from causing disease by disrupting the specific mechanisms that the microorganism engages in. A lot of the time, this is leading towards symptomatic treatments. So if we know what the symptoms of a particular infectious disease are, we can treat those symptoms, okay? Um, and this can be quite significant. So this can be quite a, a fruitful and productive intervention. So a lot of the time when we are thinking about microbial disease, we're thinking about clearing the infection. So if you want to intervene on a bacterial infection, we want to target the bacteria. If you want to intervene on a viral infection, we want to target the virus. However, we can also target, again, as I just said, the symptoms so we can target the pathogenesis, the way the microorganism is causing disease. We can disrupt the ability of the microorganism to cause disease rather than targeting the microorganism directly. This can be um, beneficial for a couple of different reasons because I'm sure we can imagine a situation where it's not possible to treat the infection. So in an ideal world, we'd be able to target the virus or target the fungi or target the bacteria. Sometimes this isn't possible. Perhaps the microorganism isn't accessible. Perhaps um, there's a resistance to particular drugs. Perhaps um, treatment is possible. So it is possible potentially to clear infection. However, this is something that takes time. And in all these situations, it becomes potentially beneficial to intervene on the pathogenesis. So to prevent the the ability of the microorganism to cause disease. Now there are a range of different examples we could use to illustrate this. Um, one that's quite clear is when we're thinking about inflammation. So as I'm sure we know, microbial infections are often associated with inflammation. So if we can calm the inflammation, if we can deal with the inflammation, we can go to some length to reducing the disease caused by the microorganism without actually targeting the microorganism itself. Um, and this is what we see in the treatment of some different viral infections. Um, one of the, I don't know if it's approved now, but it was used, um, it had like emergency authorization 
one of the drugs that was used to treat COVID um, was essentially a, a, not really an anti-inflammatory, but it mutes signaling and the signaling downstream results in inflammation. So it's preventing that from happening because as we'll talk about in many infectious diseases, inflammation is associated with disease symptoms. So one way we can deal with that situation is to prevent the signaling and that lowers the inflammation and therefore lowers disease. Um, again, we need to understand how the microorganism is impacting these pathways. So we need to understand which pathways the microorganism is activating for us to then counteract that and then mute those pathways so to intervene. Um, again, just demonstrating that principle. Uh, if we're thinking about uh, bacteria, a range of different bacteria will produce exotoxins. Again, you will have covered this last year. A number of different bacteria release exotoxins into the local environment. And these exotoxins cause disease symptoms, whether it's by manipulating the nervous system, so tetanus toxin, whether it's by um, inducing diarrhea, so cholera toxin. Um, toxins that are released by bacteria can manipulate the environment and cause disease and one way we can mitigate that is to use antitoxins so we're using an intervention that counteracts the toxins so again we're not clearing infection even though that would you know perhaps be the the ideal situation where we can clear infection but we are doing something that isn't quite that but it still can be helpful we're dealing with the symptoms um, we're targeting the microbial pathogenesis so we're reducing the ability of the microorganism to cause disease and again, if we want to do this, if we want to design these interventions, we need to actually understand microbial pathogenesis. We need to understand how the different microorganisms cause disease. So to really understand in some detail how microorganisms cause disease, we first need to establish these two key principles. So generally, we can take all microorganisms that cause disease and we can look at the way they cause disease and we can categorize those ways into two paths. Okay, so microbial pathogenesis generally either involves microorganisms directly causing disease. So microorganisms will actually do something in the host in which they directly cause disease symptoms. Um, a really clear example of this is um, so poliovirus, let's say poliovirus enters into motor neurons and it lyses the motor neurons. So an individual who's infected with poliovirus will lose motor neurons and ultimately experience paralysis because their motor neurons are being lysed by the virus. So clearly the virus is directly causing disease. Um, the second type of microbial pathogenesis we see is when microorganisms cause disease but they don't necessarily do it directly. So microorganisms will often cause disease in the host through immune function. So the microorganism will infect a host, the immune system will respond to the microorganism, and it's this immune response that causes the disease. Um, and again, this is something we talked about, or whether you were with me last year or with a different, on a different microbiology module, you would have talked about this likely, the idea that um, the immune response to infection can cause disease symptoms. So uh, if you have a, a, a hepatocyte infection, so if you have HBV um, um, infecting hepatocytes in the liver, you'll have an immune response to the virus, and this immune response causes hepatitis. Um, if you have a sore throat, um, you have an immune response to the virus replicating or the bacteria replicating in your throat and this immune response is partially causing um, the symptoms so causing the sore throat because it's causing inflammation um, as we said COVID a big part of COVID pathogenesis um, is the fact that there is an immune response to the virus and this immune response um, it, it causes a large number of the disease symptoms and again, if we understand the details of this process, we can understand how to intervene. So again, if we understand how SARS coronavirus is in inducing specific immune responses, we can potentially intervene and mute that immune response. 
if we can understand exactly how these microorganisms are causing disease, we can intervene. And this is just one aspect of our intervention on infectious disease. As we know, a huge aspect of our intervention is just targeting the virus itself, targeting the bacteria itself, targeting the fungi, stopping it from replicating, trying to get it out of the body. And that is a very, very effective um, approach. However, we can also take an additional approach or a complementary approach, which is we attempt to um, target the specific ways in which the microorganism causes disease. You will often in the textbook see this terminology used. So this idea that micro microbial pathogenesis can be direct or indirect. And again, this is just referring to the concepts we were just covering. The idea that microorganism can directly cause disease so the microorganism is directly causing um, damage, or the idea of indirect pathogenesis, where the microorganism is causing damage, but through the action of the immune system. So the damage, the disease symptoms, is only occurring because the microorganism is there. However, it's occurring via the immune response, and the clearest example of this is inflammation. If you think about the microorganism being present, then the immune system responding to the microorganism and the immune system therefore inducing inflammation and this inflammation being characteristic of a disease symptom. So if you think about, again, we talk about hepatitis, we can also think about meningitis. So meningitis is inflammation of the meninges, which surrounds the brain. Um, so if you have a microorganism present in the meninges, you'll have an immune response and the immune response causes inflammation. This inflammation is what puts pressure on the brain. Now, these concepts, again, we've, you, you've probably touched on them last year a little bit, so it's a little bit of a recap, but we can go into them in a lot more detail. And this is what I'd encourage you to start thinking about doing now, particularly if you're doing a microbiology module at level six, because there really is a requirement that you understand these in a lot more detail and um, what we have on the left is a diagram taken from MIMS Medical Microbiology um, and this diagram again differentiates between direct pathogenesis and indirect pathogenesis so for direct pathogenesis we can see either toxins are being released and these are toxins that can mess with um, the local environments so they can cause nervous system damage or they can cause diarrhea and we also see um, cytolysis can occur so if the, the microorganism can cause cells to die can cause them to lice which is what we were talking about when we said a polio virus does in motor neurons however the other type of microbial pathogenesis we discussed is this idea of indirect microbial pathogenesis and as we can see it is quite complicated there's a lot of overlapping factors strictly speaking for now we just need to know the concepts but you do really need to start familiarizing yourself with this in a little bit more detail start looking at some of the specific concepts it does get complicated because the immune system is involved and as i'm sure you know the immune system is itself very very complicated okay and here we have just some more information outlining this idea of direct pathogenesis so this idea that microorganisms can directly lie cells uh, we call this process cytolysis, um, cyto meaning cell and then lysis meaning to lyse. Um, and the best example of this, the clearest example, is poliovirus in motor neurons. Uh, we also, as we said, have exotoxins potentially involved in this process. Now, the list of microorganisms that can release exotoxins is lengthy. Um, it's mostly restricted to bacteria, however, so this tends to be a bacterial process. There is um, one virus, a rotavirus, can release toxin, um, but generally speaking, it's bacteria. It's a really interesting little niche area of microbial pathogenesis because you can read about the different actions of these different exotoxins. You can read about how they disrupt the local host environment, and what we actually see is a range of different bacteria can cause a range of different types of disease because they release different exotoxins so if we think about um, vibrio cholera so vibrio cholera releases cholera toxin cholera toxin is released in the lower gi tract where it induces diarrhea and this is why cholera infection is associated with diarrhea if we think about um, 
uh, cranibacterium diphtheria. Diphtheria um, releases diphtheria toxin. Diphtheria toxin impacts the upper respiratory tract. And if you if you read up on this in some textbooks, you'll probably be able to see some images of a a, a greyish coat of film that lines the back of the throat that can potentially obstruct the throat. And again, this is occurring because of the action of diphtheria toxin. Uh, so two very, very different types of disease, two very, very different pathologies, but both of them are caused by exotoxins, just different exotoxins that are released at different sites in the body because the bacteria colonize different sites and that act in very, very different ways. Uh, similarly, if we think about um, uh, botulism, so Clostridium botulinum, it's bacteria that will release botulism toxin. Botulism toxin impacts the uh, nervous system, so it will cause a specific type of paralysis. Um, if you think about tetanus toxin as well, so again, another type of bacteria releasing tetanus toxin. Tetanus toxin also impacts the nervous system, but it impacts the nervous system in a different way. So it impacts a diff in, in a different way and causes a different type of paralysis. So we're seeing different bacteria causing different types of disease. Um, this is despite the fact that they're all acting through exotoxins and the different types of disease are occurring because different types of exotoxin are being released. And indeed, you can look in quite a bit of detail at these different exotoxins and you can see the mechanisms by which these exotoxins cause disease. Um, and you can also see the intervention strategies that have been developed in response to these toxins. So you may see this term antitoxin used frequently. Um, antitoxin is an intervention that's used to counteract the toxins to um, prevent them from doing damage, to inactivate them, if you like. And obviously, an antitoxin is very different from an antibiotic. It's very different from an antiviral. And this is why we need to understand it, because it's a therapeutic intervention that is specifically targeting mechanisms of microbial pathogenesis rather than targeting the microorganism itself. Um, as a therapeutic intervention, it has strengths and weaknesses, and it has um, elements that can be evaluated and one of the evaluative points we can consider is we can compare antitoxin use to antibiotic use. So if an individual is suffering from a particular pathology caused by colonization with a bacteria that is releasing an exotoxin, um, what is the most appropriate intervention? Can we evaluate the different interventions? Now, you can certainly do this, you can look through the literature, but what I want to do is present to you one piece of evaluation that's really important you understand. Um, these exotoxins are being released by bacteria. This means that if an individual is colonised by one of these species of bacteria, so they have a large number of this bacteria living on the person or in them, um, if they are treated with antibiotics, there is a risk, and again, this depends on the particular bacteria, that by treating the infection with antibiotics, you could release a large amount of toxin into their system because the antibiotic is going to kill the bacteria. It's going to compromise the integrity of the bacterial cell and the contents of the bacteria is therefore potentially going to be released into the local environment. If these bacteria are full of toxin that they've been producing, then all this toxin this exotoxin could be released into the local environment and cause, could cause really, really severe disease symptoms. So when we're thinking about exotoxins and treating these infections, we, we, we need to think about this specific element. And this is something you can read up in the literature, the different approaches that we can think about when we're talking about, when we're discussing um, bacteria that release exotoxins because again, we see this alternative intervention. We see the um, antitoxin, and the antitoxin is something that can neutralize the toxin that's being released by the bacteria. Here is a, 
a reasonably thorough explanation of one of the examples we just mentioned. So we're talking about tetanus toxin released by Clostridium tetani, and this is a toxin that is impacting on the nervous system. So what it's essentially doing is it's preventing the release of inhibitory transmitter, and this is a synapse here. Um, so we are getting continual transmission across the synapse. And the reason is because there's no inhibitory transmitter being released, so we get continuous excitation. And this is um, why it's causing paralysis, right? Because it's preventing the nervous system from regulating itself properly. We're observing continuous stimulation. Um, and therefore it's causing spastic paralysis. Another example here, we have Vibrio cholera and we have cholera toxin. And we have here, um, described in the diagram, the specific action of the toxin. Essentially what's happening is the cholera toxin is causing dysregulation of normal cell function. It's causing increased adenylate cyclase activity, which is ultimately resulting in the movement of ions outside of the cell. Um, and with this movement, there's movement of water. So water is residing in the lumen of the lower intestine rather than residing in the cells. And therefore, this is why diarrhea is experienced because there is water in the stool. Um, don't need to worry about the details of what's going on here. We just need to understand the principle. We're talking about different types of exotoxins impacting local host cell environments in different ways. And this is why we have specific infections associated with specific um, disease symptoms. So there we've covered the, the principal types of direct pathogenesis. So we've talked about really the main ways in which microorganisms can induce uh, disease symptoms in a host. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of a niche way here that we want to add on and also talk about because there's some various other um, less prominent ways in which microorganisms can directly cause damage to the host. And this example here is the ability of some bacteria to form biofilms on the teeth. And these bacteria can potentially be producing lactic acid. And then this lactic acid can play a role in dental decay. So obviously here we have a process that in which the bacteria is directly causing pathology However, it's not doing it from the two mechanisms we talked about. So it's not doing it by causing um, cell death and it's not doing it by releasing um, exotoxins. Um, th th there's a third mechanism here and that's what we're talking about. We can also consider some other ways in which uh, microorganisms can cause disease directly in a host. We can think about things like physical obstructions uh, we can think about microorganisms that result in cyst formations. And if we have a cyst forming in a sensitive organ, then just the physical presence of the cyst can disrupt the function of the organ. If we're talking about the lumen of the lower intestine, if we have a microorganism residing in this region um, and it's physically taking up space, then it can potentially cause disease that way by just presenting a blockage and therefore, again, preventing the normal function of the local system. In this example, because the microorganism is present as a physical barrier. And just a reminder, when we're talking about microorganisms in this context, we're using it as a bit of an open term. We're not necessarily only referring to organisms that are microscopic, even though that's technically what microorganism means. We're also using it potentially to refer to parasitic worms, so to the helminths that can reside in the lower intestine. Obviously, they're not microscopic. However, they do have microscopic stages in their life cycle, and they cause disease in the same way or a comparable way to true microorganisms that infect a host. So it makes sense to think of them alongside the microorganisms. If this doesn't sound familiar, if this isn't clear, if you don't really know the difference between um, parasitic worm and protozoa and virus and bacteria, then you need to go back to whatever level four microbiology module you've done and really look through your notes and make sure um, you understand the, the fundamental information that we're building on here. Okay, and just a resource here to um, reinforce what I've said. We're talking about Ascaris here, so Ascariasis, uh, parasitic worm residing in the lower GI tract, and 
when we're thinking about microbial pathogenesis, we need to think about any niche areas. We need to, again, evaluate on one potential um, evaluation point that you could stumble across here in the research, and this is just an example, is the idea that when these lower GI tract infections caused by parasitic worms are infected, you can potentially result in an additional direct pathogenesis mechanism whereby the um, therapeutic intervention can have killed the worm, but then because the worm is dead, then it presents a physical obstruction, more of a physical obstruction than when it was alive. So again, this is direct pathogenesis, but interestingly, this, this is really occurring as a consequence of the um, initial treatment. Finally, as we said, we want to consider indirect pathogenesis. Now, indirect pathogenesis refers to the ability of microorganisms to cause disease indirectly. So the immune system responds to the microorganism, and it's the immune response that um, is characteristic of the particular disease symptoms. Um, central to this is a feature called LPS. So many bacteria possess LPS in their outer surface. LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide. You'll also see LPS referred to as endotoxin. So, so far we've been talking about exotoxins. These are toxins that are released by bacteria and that once released, they induce disease symptoms. Endotoxins are not exotoxins. Endotoxins are present on the bacterial surface, really. Um, endotoxin and LPS, can, they're interchangeable, really. They're synonymous. When we're talking about endotoxin, we're talking about LPS. We're talking about lipopolysaccharide. Now, lipopolysaccharide is referred to as endotoxin because it induces a very, very potent immune response. And a large number of bacteria cause disease via LPS. So the immune system responds to LPS and the disease symptoms are therefore induced. When we're discussing the specific pathways that LPS induces disease symptoms through, um, we don't want to go into them really, it's just beyond the context of the module. We just need to understand that LPS induces an immune response. This immune response is complex, it is primarily in the innate arm of the immune system. And again, as we can see on the right hand side of the slide, it is overlapping. There's a lot of different things going on, but we really just need to understand that LPS is this bacterial component that is inducing an immune response and that this immune response can be characterized by disease symptoms. Finally, we can think of the hypersensitivities. So the hypersensitivities are the other type of indirect pathogenesis. So by hypersensitivity, we mean hypersensitivity of the immune system. So the immune system can be overactive. It can overactivate in response to certain features. And this overactivity can result in different types of pathology. Um, we don't really want to go into them in any detail now. We can be aware there are four of them. If you do want to read up on them, the information's there. Um, you, if you're doing a microbiology module next year, they'll be covered in a lot of detail, but we just need to know that hypersensitivities fall under this banner of indirect pathogenesis um, when there is microbial involvement. Okay, everyone, uh, that's what we wanted to cover in that session. So I hope you found the information useful. I hope it's given you um, a bit of a clearer idea of exactly how microorganisms can cause disease. It hasn't been comprehensive. We haven't gone into as much detail as we will, let's say, next year in some specific elements. However, we've established some of the key concepts um, and there's been some information filtered throughout the talk that should have been really, really useful for your case study. Um, if there's anything particularly you didn't understand, I'd encourage you to go back, listen again. Um, I'd also can encourage you to access um, various textbooks. Um, the diagrams for this lecture are taken from MIMS Medical Microbiology, which is really, really useful when covering pathogenesis. There's a specific chapter on it that's really, really good. So if you're struggling with anything, uh, please do look it up. Uh, okay, thanks very much. Take care.